My name is Alan Anderson. I'm uh, with a company that was originally out of Toronto, Ontario, Canada, called uh, Employment Management Professionals. I'm now out of a ranch on, in Brazil. So I have moved, and I've come all this way from Brazil. At least you've got the same weather that I had in Brazil, because <laughs> when I went to Toronto, it was freezing. Uh, what we're going to do today is going to look at models and ideas around helping folks who have some kind of employment barrier, especially folks who have what we would call a significant employment barrier, but we can use almost any level of employment barrier, and helping those folks to be able to get a job. So let me just show you this challenge that we're going to work with. How does an organization and its employees have to think and act differently to generate employment success with four people with employment barriers? So this first half of this, these two presentations is about the concepts that underlie being able to work with these populations and to have a significant amount of success with these populations. So I will discuss the thinking, the concepts, the ideas, and the strategies that are different with working with a buried population as opposed to somebody who can find their own job. And that's really the distinction here. Those who can go out, find their own job, that population you already serve really well, it's the population who are unable to do that that we are most interested in. Now, I listened to Jamie at your luncheon presentation and you seem to have an enormous amount of tasks on your plate especially around this notion of collaboration, uh, both with employers and then also with, with partners. So when I show you these models, they're not meant as any kind of critique, but I am going to tell you that many of the models currently being used uh, to service this population will not actually work for this population. There is a really a completely rethink of how we serve this population that has to be put in place. So I'm not trying to increase the amount of work you have to do, because you already seem you have to have an enormous amount of work with all this collaboration you have to take, that you have to uh, solve. Okay, there's our solution. So for, I, I've been in this business for about 35 years. So what I'm gonna show you is what we've learned over those 35 years to getting people out to work. And uh, with the uh, various knowledge, tips and things to avoid, a lot of things that you should actually avoid. We've gone through this many of the strategies inside our business because my field was vocational rehabilitation. I also have a pretty significant business background, but my real love was vocational rehabilitation and I've really adapted many of my business practices to vocational rehabilitation and the human services world. And what we're gonna show you, there are many things you really have to stay away from, not go through the trial and error of figuring out that this doesn't work. I'm hoping we're gonna tell you it doesn't work at this point and you'll believe us. If not, you can ask Keith because he went through our system too and he'll tell you what things work and what things don't work. Uh, so often new thinking or augmented thinking is needed to assist people with employment barriers. And that's kind of a gentle way of putting it. Really the model completely reverses itself on how you serve them. So as we go through this, I'd like you to ask questions and how you see this fitting with how you currently think. So our ideas are generally non-traditional and will present challenges to older models. All right, um, I put up my credentials around uh, human services, but give, listening to Jamie at lunchtime, I think you need to hear some numbers. This model works for any number of people that you like. It works if you place one person a year or if you place thousands. So we have a program that we ran in Ontario and they were placing between 200 and 400,000 disadvantaged youth a year. And all of them in qualified jobs. It meant they had to have a job that would raise them up out of poverty. That was how it was designed. Uh, we also work, I'm currently doing some work here right now, with refugees. And they are people who have good education, good skills, but no employment. All right, so we know that it works with any level of barrier, and we know that we can produce any levels of numbers. We had a welfare group that we were working with. Their goal was 85,000 placements in, I think it was 16 months. It was a government-sponsored program, much the same as what you're doing with workforce, mixed group of people, collaboration with all sorts of other partners. They used the old traditional model. In about a year, they had 25,000 placements. We switched it to this model. It took us about a month to make the switch. And they were desperate, so they were willing to apply the model. And in the next six months, we placed 60,000 people. So these numbers I'm showing to you because I wanted to show you that when Jamie spoke, that you have a big challenge. But this big challenge that you have can also be solved partially by the model I'm going to show you. Because it deals with anybody you want to place, the model will serve them. 
whereas the model currently in many places we see only serves a select part of the population. And we base our model on what we call a repeat business model. So the collaboration with employers is really built around the notion of getting them to do business with us time and time and time again and building a different type of relationship with the employer as opposed to, and I, if you ask me, I'll tell you how to do it if I have time. We move away from what's called a supplier relationship. We do not build relationships around supply, uh, supplying workers. We move into what's called a partner relationship. And what we're trying to do is connect with that individual employer in a way that they see us as a valuable asset in the overall vision they hold for their company, as opposed to a partner around shared values. So it's a very different type of approach. It produces way better results when you move to a, in that direction. But you have to understand the models to get there. All right, the benefits of this, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You'll just get lots more jobs for lots more people. They'll get better jobs. People will love you, and let's move on. <laughs> All right, and Jamie will love you because it'll fulfill your mandate. All right, so here's what I need you to do. As I go through this, I need you to think about the ideas as it challenges ideas you currently have. Please feel free to ask any questions that you like. If I don't finish this presentation, I don't finish this presentation because we have a discussion I'd like to customize as much as I can around your particular needs. So uh, I am going to challenge older models. It's not a critique of those older models. It's just going to say these models don't work in certain places. And if the new model is put in place, it works everywhere and it can be incorporated within the old model. All right, so who are people with employment barriers is what I'm going to talk about first. Then I'm going to show you the the service delivery model changes. Then I'm going to talk about strategy and management. How many of you are managers here? All right, so the strategy and management will just give you a different way to think about this. I don't know how big your workforce grants are. What's an average size of a workforce grant? They're, they change by region? A couple hundred thousand, million? Okay. All right, so uh, again, if you are caught within financial restraints, saying I have to do these things within financial restraints, okay, if you ask me that, I will tell you things that you should do that will give you the biggest bang for your buck. So if I only got this much money, because we work with organizations that don't have a nickel, and they still want to put their people out, and they say, how can I rearrange my management structure or my organizational structure so these people can actually go out? All right, so I'll give you some of that. And then job and hiring dynamics, that may, we may not get there. And that is, what is different about employment for people with a significant employment or with an employment barrier? All right, just want to clarify things, something that Kelsey brought up before we started. Here's what we consider an employment barrier. I, I heard an expanded view of that, and I'll just explain what that is. Any visible or recognizable characteristic that tells the employer, for them, the employer, that you are an atypical candidate, all right? So anything that says to the employer when you apply for a job that you are not their typical candidate, whatever that may be. And it can be things like, I put them on the bottom, visible disabilities, culture, age, gender, phallum, place of origin, education, level. It can be any of those and even more. Right? If the employer sees you as atypical, you now have an employment barrier. Why? Because they won't consider you. Right? If they consider you and you're atypical with one employer and another employer considers you, then the one that considers you, you do not have an employment barrier. So we have people that have a barrier with, uh, in a certain region of where they live and then in another region they have no barrier at all. But we're looking at what's called an atypical employee. So employers tend towards typical and not atypical candidates and exclude the atypical. Now, here's the key here. I put it on the top, visible. You have to be able to see it. And I don't mean just see it with your eyes. You have to be able to see it. You can hear, hear it. You can feel that there's something wrong. There's something different about this candidate. So an example, we do not regard depression. We do not regard heart disease. We do not regard diabetes as employment barriers. Nobody can see them. All right? So we, they're irrelevant to us. The ones we regard are the ones you can identify. Because once it's identified, it gets in the way of the hiring process. Now, Kelsey identified some others, and at some point, you may want me to talk about them, but at this one I'm talking about employment. She identified things like childcare, transportation, barriers that are external to the candidate that gets in their way of being able to get to employment, right? Some of those they can control, some of those they can't. I heard 
this notion of soft skills when Jamie was talking, that a lot of you are working on the area of soft skills. As soon as you talk about soft skills, and as soon as you talk about barriers to employment that don't belong to a characteristic of the candidate, you are now talking about motivation. The key to all of those things is motivation. You have to be able to ascertain whether this person actually wants to go to work or not. Because if they don't want to go to work, there's nothing you can do for them. So if they don't want to go to work and they have poor soft skills, I don't care how many times you treat them or train them to say, hello, it's nice, you know, be real pleasant, it's not going to work. The motivation is what carries all human beings through change. So if you want them to change, if you want them to take care of their childcare responsibilities or their transportation responsibilities or their bad behavior responsibilities, you must be able to address their motivation issues. I'm not addressing those today. Right? That's a whole other strategy. So we are only addressing, will there be a job offer on the table that this person will accept and will be at a level that they can live at? That's what we're addressing in the session we're going to do today. So sorry, Kelsey. Uh, if I have some time in the second session, I will talk very briefly about motivation. But there is some excellent stuff in motivation right now. And I'll tell you, every program that I deal with, their primary problem is they do not, in their training, deal with motivation. They deal with soft skills or hard skills training, but no motivation. So they're assuming something. What are they assuming? They're all motivated, right? And the ones that are will respond well. And the ones that aren't will. And guess who you're getting? This, Jamie said this this morning. Guess who you're getting now with this hot economy? All the impulse, deci all the impulse deciders. Well, I walk by your office. Oh, it looks like that might be a good idea. I'm going to go in and do it. And then as it becomes more trying or difficult, what do they do? Yeah, they leave, they demotivate, they become disruptive, and you can't address them, and you often will begin to exclude them. Right? Now, there's many populations with barriers who are automatically demotivated by the fact that they can't get a job. Right? My example, how many of you have ever worked with the blind? You have, Keith, I know you have. How many work with the blind? All right, good, then you won't know the stat. What's the unemployment rate amongst the blind? 85%. How many of them do not have an education? Next to none. There's millions that your government is pouring into all the services for the blind in every state of this union. Millions. I have people in Florida who have been trained for a million dollars. That's how much money they got for their training. A million dollars, they're all still unemployed. We have two PhDs, master's degrees, they're unemployed. Why? Because the barrier makes them atypical, not unmotivated. But they become unmotivated. Why? Because they've done all the training, they've taken every course you can think of, and they're still unemployed. That's the problem with courses that can't address either finding you a job, or ensuring that you find a job, or dealing with your motivation. It all becomes to a big end. Now that doesn't mean some people are not naturally demotivated. There are some that have chosen not to go to work, absolutely. But most of them we find, once we put a motivation intervention in place, we can deal with most of those issues. All right, so let's start with the change. This is the most common model everybody uses for training and for employment. It's called the job readiness model. You may or may not recognize it. Uh, but most people will recognize it because it is what everybody thinks will make somebody get a job. And that is intake, assessment, training, and placement. All right? Are you eligible? What do you need? I train you in what you need, and then you'll find a job. Do you know this model? <laughs> sounds so familiar. Yeah, it sounds. Because everybody uses it. It's based on an education model. It's based on what you did when you went to school, when you went to university, you used the same model. All right, what's the problem with, well, let's not do the problem. This model's base is what's called a linear model. It only moves in one direction. So if you have a problem candidate, or a candidate that's not making it, or a candidate that made it all the way and doesn't succeed, can you run them through the system again? Very difficult, because they keep getting the same information. It's not like it's a new course unless they've decided to take something different. I was going to be a mechanic, now I've decided to become a chef. You could make that kind of an argument. But generally, that's not what's happening. It stops. The model just stops. And the person who is not successful just stops. And that's a problem for us.
because most of the people that I work with, and I work primarily with significant employment barriers. I work with the hardest to place. Most of those people never make it through this model. They always end up in two strategies, what we call perpetual training. So if you know ARC Industries, that's where they end up. They train for the rest of their lives, trying to become competitive. Or intensification, they train harder. And that doesn't work. All right, so this model is based on the notion you get a job by acquiring competitive competencies. That's how you get a job, right? So you're going to measure up to what the employer tells you they need, and that's going to get you the job, All right? When we began to work with our folks, we did this. We tried to get them to this level of competitive competencies, but we had a problem. They didn't get there. So based on competitive competencies, but is this the only way to get a job? All right, so here's the question we asked ourselves years ago when it began to say, OK, we've got to change this whole system. Have you ever worked beside somebody incompetent? <laughs> Everybody says, yeah.